In today's lecture, we're going to go through a family of minerals called the halides. This is a family of about 150 different minerals, but we're only going to talk about three of them today. In the textbook, this is pages 374 and 375 to kind of give an introduction to the family. And then we go through the systematic mineralogy in the textbook on 393 to 397. In general, this family has a bunch of shared traits. So we could say this common traits or shared traits of the halides. And there's just a few things here I wanted to get into. One of them has to do with how they're, it's basically, this is all chemistry. And the way that the shared traits work is that every time you have a halide, you take a halogen. And if I say halogen, you should think back to your chemistry. And you think, oh, the halogens are anions. And they're a special group of anions that are on the far, how do we say this, the far right-hand side of the periodic table that have a 1 minus charge. You probably don't know what they all are off the top of your head, but it's things like chlorine, bromine, iodide, and fluorine. Those are our halogens. And those halogens bond with a really weak cation. These are the cations on the far left side of the periodic table. And this bonding that I symbolize with the plus sign is an ionic bond. And in fact, what we want to do is we're going to go number two here, and we're going to say that the nature of the bonding is it's nearly perfect. You can have covalent bonds, you can have ionic bonds, and you can have combinations between the two. But because the electronegativity difference between the anion and the cation is so great, we have almost perfect um, ionic bonding. And this near-perfect um, ionic bonding controls so many different aspects of the mineralogy. It makes them soft with low hardnesses. It gives them really pronounced cleavages. It also gives them this um, radius ratio and like ionic sphericity that makes them have cubic coordination or octahedral coordination. And that means... They crystallize in the isometric system, and specifically in the crystal class that you have learned, 4 over m, bar 3, 2 over m. These are properties that all the halogens share together. I'm going to throw in this, uh, this is an image from the textbook. Can I shrink this a little bit? Yeah, there we go. So if we take a look at this, what we see are a couple things. We see great sphericity in these drawings, and I, that's actually the way I want you to visualize it, not just um, as a schematic from a textbook, but with great sphericity in the, ion, in the ions, right, of the positive weakly charged and the negative uh, anions of the, the halogens. So the other thing I want to do here is I said that the coordination, now I don't need you to memorize things like, oh, these have octahedral and cubic coordination, but I do want you to nod your head because you do know what those things mean. So if we were to take uh, sodium right here and we try to figure out what is the coordination, well, we count and we see the arrangement of the chlorines around it. And what we're going to find is there's one, two, three, four, five, six surrounding, right? And if we were to draw how that is, arranged around it, we see this shape take form, right? And you know this form. This is an octahedral, uh, octahedron. And so we can say that this has an octahedral um, coordination. So I think that's a neat part of the chemistry of halogens and, or sorry, the halides. And now we don't need to talk about chemistry anymore as we go through the systematic part of the mineralogy. So of the minerals we're going to talk about today, halite is the most important. The chemical formula is NaCl. In the textbook, it's 393 to 394, just a couple of pages. And I'll throw a picture in here, too, to guide us or to distract us as we're going through the notes. If we in the past, we've had chemistry as number one. We're not going to do that today because we could just say C above. All right, so ask, let's get rid of chemistry. So actual number one here is going to be the mineralogy of halite. Well, hardness, this is a 2.5. Specific gravity, this is very light. It's a 2.16. That's going to have some major geologic significance later. When we identify halite in the rock record or in 
a lab exam, for example, there's going to be a couple things we see. One is that the specimens are generally clear, but they don't have to be. They can actually be any color where the color is going to be staining by impurities, but most of the time you're going to see things as clear. They're going to have a luster that is vitreous, and we can see a nice vitreous luster in this specimen. But if there's been too many hands touching the samples, or it's been too long out in nature and experiencing the elements and salt starts to dissolve, we end up getting actually a greasy luster. And I think a greasy kind of gross luster is more common for identifying halite. When we look at crystal form and cleavage, there's some very diagnostic things. One is that um, salt grows as cubes and it also cleaves as cubes. And so we're going to look for cubic angles, okay? Or uh, this may just means 90 degree angles. We don't have to see perfect cubes necessarily. They could be rectangles, but we're looking for 90 degree angles. And this is produced by a perfect cubic cleavage. cleavage or cubic growth. They both happen. The other thing I want to talk to you about growth is that sometimes we don't see, like we picture cubes, we picture this, right? Well, what ends up happening with salt a lot, oh yeah, and by the way, halite is salt. You guys all knew that though, right? When we see cubic growth, it's not always like perfect solid cubes. Instead, there's this stack, almost like a hollow, sometimes the word is skeletal look, where there are these like openings kind of growing in the faces. And we see it here in this image from the textbook. Notice how the faces kind of have these like indentations. Sometimes that is called skeletal because we're growing these bones out and it's not filling in the body. And you can see the same thing here in this natural sample, right? Like, see, there's like this void right here and the crystal is growing outward. Now, this is also called hopper growth. So this is just to be something I would say, look for in the specimens in your lab. Do you see skeletal or hopper growth? And then the last thing about the mineralogy is of course taste. And we can make jokes about taste as much as you want. And depending on your personality, this is your first or last resort in terms of identification. Of course, we always have to be thinking about germs when we are considering, are we doing taste tests? Now, the geology, is this, gonna, this is a two, right? This is a two. This is our geologic occurrence. I don't like spelling the word occurrence very often, so I'm stopping with that now. And we're just going to talk about it as geology. Now, the number one way that halite is produced is from evaporation. It's an evaporite mineral from marine or non-marine environments. So we're going to say evaporite from marine, right? This is uh, salt water or non-marine. I want to introduce another word to you here with non-marine. This is called, when you have a lake that evaporates, fills with water and evaporates, repeatedly, we call it a playa lake system. So if you, so I just want to add that to your vocabulary. Playa lake environment could be a place where we deposit a lot of halite. Now once you get the salt in the rock record, then um, it's called rock salt. So rock salt is um, salt in subsurface. And when it's in the salt subsurface, it's buried with shales and limestones and uh, sandstones above it and below it and all around it. And it starts to behave in a really weird way. And it's called salt tectonics. So we're going to put here salt tectonics. And what salt tectonics means is that salt is not static in the subsurface. Instead, it is very buoyant. Okay, salt is very buoyant. This density is 2.16, and you compare that to uh, like a sandstone, which is 2.7 grams per centimeter cubed. This is incredibly buoyant and wants to get out of the subsurface, and it will squish out because salt has a viscosity. Well, viscosity means resistance to flow. 
So that means when you put pressure on salt, um, it will viscously deform and flow. How fast? Well, it'll actually flow pretty slowly, but on the order of like one millimeter per year. So if you have millions of years because of geologic time, you can actually get significant flow in salt. Uh, what is the viscosity? Uh, the units here might not be very intuitive, but it's about 10 to 13 pascal seconds. And for reference, I'll just put it over here on the margin, like a basalt lava flow on Hawaii that you've seen the beautiful videos of. This is about 10 to 3 pascal seconds. And real tectonics driven by the mantle, this has a viscosity of around 10 to the 22 pascal seconds. So it's not as stiff as the mantle, or sorry, it's not as, it flows more readily than the mantle, but it is much more thick and sticky resisting flow than a normal lava flow. But this ability to flow produces very interesting features in the subsurface that can be worth a lot of money because of oil traps. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to draw this and then we'll briefly uh, write it out. So here's the surface of the earth at time one. Here is the same surface of the earth at time two, and here's the same surface of the earth at time three. Now in the subsurface, we're gonna have a salt layer, shown here in blue. Ah oh, man, I wish I could draw it slightly cleaner. And above the salt layer, there's shales and other sedimentary rocks above it and below it. Okay, no viscous fluid has started to move yet. But given time, it's going to start to bulb its way, trying to travel to the other surface. Okay, so we're going to make it, make it a little thicker under those bulbs, a little thinner in the other places, because the salt has started to try to flow upwards. All right? Find its way to the surface. But eventually, at time three, the salt will actually have created this pipe-like vertical bulbous mass that is working its way up to the surface. And as it's doing that, it's having to move away and deform all the sedimentary rocks surrounding it. And so this feature is called a salt dome. So what we've just done is drawn a sequence of salt dome formation. And the thing that is being domed is the sedimentary rocks around it, right? So we are doming the said rocks surrounding it. Let me show you some actual pictures like from textbooks about this. So here's an example um, of what could happen. The salt domes up and domes the surrounding sedimentary rocks and it can create traps for natural gas and oil. So it's very important in the oil industry to find these salt domes. This is an example of um, the surface manifestation in, in a place in Louisiana where you can see a salt dome has um, started to poke its way out of the surface and cause deformation. Now in a place that rains a lot, you don't see the salt at the surface because it dissolves. But in a place like Iran or Pakistan, big desert area areas, these salt domes will actually reach the Earth's surface and spill out over the landscape, making these things called uh, salt glaciers, because the rainfall is not enough to dissolve the salt. Isn't that a fascinating thing? I think it's pretty incredible. But that's what I wanted to teach you about salt. Let's move on to the last two halides. Um, sylvite is going to be C. Sylvite, we're going to basically skip. It is the potassium chloride. If you want to read more about it, it's briefly talked about on page 395. It has some importance as a fertilizer, and really the general thing here is that it's very similar to halite. All the properties are about the same as halite. It's a little softer, it's a little lower density. Um, the one difference is in the evaporation sequence, it's the last in the evaporation sequence. You have to evaporate all the water, essentially, to get any sylvite to form. Salt forms at 10% uh, water remaining. Sylvite is like 5% uh, water remaining or 1% water remaining. In my rock collection, my teaching collection, it's red because of impurities, but 
it can be really, um, it should be clear. And then the other thing is, again, we don't really do taste testing, but it is much more bitter than uh, halite. So there's one way to identify it if you're a field geologist working the problem. Maybe not a mineralogist and student in class. So here's a picture. It's a little red, but it's not the natural color. It's stained by impurities, but probably your collection, it'll be red as well. Now the last mineral to talk about in the halide group is fluorite. This is one of my favorite minerals. And the reason why it's one of my favorite minerals is because it's particularly beautiful and it's really common and it can occur in any color of the rainbow. But one of the downsides about fluorite is like no economic use at all. Uh, its chemical formula is CaF2. In the textbook, it's pages 396 to 397. And okay, so we're going to say here, um, it's really common in the rock record, but limited economic value. Only the, like the most pure fluorite, they can take the F the fluorine from it and use it for hydrofluoric acid production, but it's mostly just kind of considered junk, but beautiful junk. Mineralogically, let's see, we got the mineralogy of fluoride. It has a hardness of four, so it's harder than a lot of the minerals we've talked about so far, and it's dense. It has a specific gravity of about 3.2. So it's heavier than a lot of the other clear minerals out there. And so I actually think these are two very important parameters for identifying fluorite in labs and lectures. Um, I had mentioned that it can occur in any color. Here's just an example of a fluorite that's been polished, and you can see all the different colors, even in this single chunk. I'll leave it there for a second. Uh, the next thing I also want to talk about is this picture here of fluorite. Because this allows us to get into growth versus cleavage. And this is very important for the mineralogy of flora. Because it can occur in any color, we can't use color as a diagnostic property. Instead, so what we look for is we look for how it crystallizes. And it crystallizes as cubes. But it cleaves as octahedrons. This is super important because it is fairly hard to like if so this right here i need you to train your brain that when you start to see octahedrons that are so clear and clean of any color maybe greens and purples yellows these are probably cleavage fragments of fluorite but when you see cubic surfaces these are actually growth features and i think being able to recognize the difference between the two is tricky because these look like growth features, but they're not. They're cleavage fragments. But being able to get familiar with this appearance is really going to help you identify fluorite um, pretty easily. A couple other mineralogical things that are interesting about fluorite. One is that it fluoresces, or I guess we could say it is fluorescent. And in fact, that fluorite, right? You see how that's spelled similarly? And oh yeah, by the way, that's hard to spell. It's U before O. This name of fluorescence was first identified in the mineral fluorite, hence the name. It's also thermoluminescent, or at least many specimens are, not that you get to do it, but if you ever have fluorite, you want to put it like in your oven or on the stovetop, you'll see that it starts to glow when it heats up. So that's just some interesting optical properties and electronic properties of the mineral fluorite. And then so to finish off this lecture, let's just talk about the geology of fluorite. Uh, what is this? Is this two? Yeah, this is two. So the geologic occurrence of fluorite is that it is deposited in hydrothermal veins. We've started talking about hydrothermal veins because of gold and silver. Well, this is also in hydrothermal veins. And in an upcoming lecture, we're going to really dig deep into how the hydrothermal geologic occurrence works. Let's just wait on it a little bit for now. Hydrothermal means hot fluids. These hot fluids must have a lot of calcium ions and fluorine ions dissolved inside of it. And they'll eventually get precipitated and deposited alongside many other valuable ore minerals. So 
Fluorite itself doesn't have value, but it's associated with value. So deposit hydrothermal veins with valuable ore minerals. Most commonly, it's deposited with um, silver minerals and lead minerals and zinc minerals. This is an association that I think is actually, all right, so we're going to say this. These are the associations. And sometimes this is the most helpful thing for identification. You know, to look for things together, they're like cousins. Well, it helps you make identifications. But in these hydrothermal veins, we have this valuable ore. Guess what happens to fluorite? It gets called the garbage. And in geology speak, the garbage is also called the gang. And so it is a gang mineral. That means it's the less valuable material that is mined and extracted from the earth. So we can consider it a mining waste. That's the main story for fluorite and the halides. We'll pick up next time with a big discussion on how hydrothermal systems work.